Hey, what up everyone? Corey Taylor here from Stone Sour, and you are watching Livewire. Or Loudwire. Oh, <laughs> one more. <laughs> Bang, <laughs> sucking <laughs> shag BD. I'm sitting next to Corey Taylor, of course of Slipknot, but right now he's here with Stone Sour on his very lovely tour with Papa Roach. Hmm. Thank you so much for your time. No worries. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you finally because I wanted to tell you that I feel like you're the Samuel L. Jackson of metal. All right. Because... All right. I love that. And this is why, because <laughs> nobody in metal says motherfucker better than As, you do. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm a motherfucking master yeah. of it, so... Absolutely. <laughs> when, did, when did you uh, learn that you had that skill? Um... That's a great question. I got a. I almost got expelled in kindergarten for, for like All the for real. Back like that's a true story. Like, yeah, my. Because uh, and, and at the time, like I had no idea what these words were. I just heard them around the house and whatnot. And uh, you know, there was there was like the, you know when you're a kid. At least this is the way I was growing up. That, that you'd get like all these weird rhymes and stuff. There was one that when I I sort of got when I was in kindergarten. Motherfucking titty asshole shitty, and I just thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. So I would run around my neighborhood, motherfucking titty asshole shitty, this little gnarly six year old kid, you know. So uh, yeah, my my uh, my love for these wonderfully woody words goes way back. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, I'm and, sure it is. <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, Stone Sour, you had. Released House of Golden Bones Part 1. Number 2 is coming very soon. Uh, how would you compare the two records? Um, well, you know, uh, Part 1 is a really, really great, like, heavy hard rock album. You know, it's got a lot of wonderful layers to it. The Part 2, in a lot of ways, is, is darker, is heavier. Um, it, it's more complex. It's probably the most experimental we've ever been with our music. And... Uh, it it flows more like a soundtrack to a movie than it than than part one does, you know, because part one kind of sets the tone, and then part two just really finishes the story in a great way. It follows the narrative a lot more, and um, it just feels like some type of just like cinematic vibe, which was really kind of what we were going for. Yeah, and speaking of the the narrative, you've got the. Uh, graphic novels yeah. coming out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the artwork for it looks incredible. Yeah. I mean, uh, is there anything you can tell us about that, or a any other graphic novel you may be able to compare yours to? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, it, it's being released uh, in, in uh, like single trades uh, before before we do a graph, like a graphic novel for it. Um, so it's a it's a four part miniseries that is coming out through Dark Com uh, Dark Horse Comics. And, I mean, honestly, the only thing I can kind of compare it to would be something like if Neil Gaiman and Garth Ennis got together and, and did a comic together, you know, like story-wise, you know. I mean, it's got it's got this very sci-fi fantasy kind of vibe to it, but at the, at the same time, the characters are very gritty and uh, fairly realistic, and there's some pretty good offensive language going on in there and some wonderfully... Uh, descriptive metaphors uh but other than that man it just feels like a really good comic book you know i just got the uh i just got the illustrations back you know with, without the color and without the lettering and whatnot and i was so stoked man just from a fan point of view i was just like here's my comic and i ran around with my computer like showing it off like I'd, my son had just been born you know so uh yeah i, I think it's gonna appeal to people who like you know like a really good story like a mystery you know trying to you know piece together puzzles and whatnot and i think it's just a great visual representation of the short story i wrote for the albums yeah and uh another part of the seemingly massive amount of things that stone sour is about to do uh read that you're planning to do a series of shows in yeah. 2014 perhaps yeah. uh one show you play part one, the other part two, uh, with some elaborate stage setup. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any ideas for that stage setup, and is there any possible way that it could outdo Slipknot's stage setup? That would be hard to do. I mean, <laughs> coming as a member of that other band, I mean, it's, you know, you, you, with, with Slipknot, you're guaranteed that anything we bring on stage could kill you <laughs> at any point, you know, so... Um, with Stone Sour, you know, and, and there's really no competition with it. But with me, you know, tr kind of trying to, you know, kind of put the things together and then getting these ideas out. 
my idea was to kind of borrow more from Roger Waters doing The Wall live than, you know, doing something like Slipknot, you know, because it's it's more thematic at the end of the day and there'll be more things going on and there'll be moving pieces and and things that really kind of develop over the shows, you know. So to me it was more about doing that and really almost treating it like a theater piece, you know, almost like a musical and and trying to engage the audience in a way that we never had before. Wow. And uh, you're about to release your second book. Yeah. Uh, I think people are excited for that. And I saw the working title was A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Heaven. Yeah. Is that still the, the working title? Oh, that's title? the working title. They made me write a subtext for it as well, which is very involved. <laughs> let's see if I have it here on my phone. It's, uh, <laughs> let's see. And it's right here. A funny thing happened on the way to heaven, or how I made peace with the paranormal and stigmatized zealots and cynics in the process. <laughs> Beautiful. So basically, I'm trying to piss off everyone at this point. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm nearly done with it. Um, I, I got a few more weeks before I have to turn it in, and uh, it's going to be really cool. I just did the 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 photos for the book with uh, my good friend uh, Paul Brown, who did the photos for the last book, and. Uh, it's going to have a different uh, vibe to it, but it's kind of set up the same way, you know, where it's, it's, it's a discussion, you know, and it's me trying to figure out how, you know, how I can have this, this deep belief in, in the supernatural and the paranormal and what like that. And yet I'm still a, a pretty vocal atheist, you know, so it's me trying to find an, a new way to, to figure out what these things are, you know, because I, you know, I've seen I've seen a lot in my life when it comes to this side of things, and I refuse to just write it off like a lot of you know cynics would, and 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 I'm trying to you know kind of work it out from honestly from a scientific and mathematical point of view. So there's a lot of that in the book. There's also a lot of uh, um, stories, you know, that of the, the experiences I've seen, the places I've lived. Um, the places I've worked. There's a whole chapter about the mansion in uh, in, oh, in Los Angeles, the Houdini Mansion, which is incorrect because not one person named Houdini ever lived there. But it's it's gotten that name because so many people. It's almost like the the game telephone. One person says one thing and it changes and changes and changes, and all of a sudden people call it the Houdini Mansion. They lived around the corner, actually. That not okay. no one by the name of Houdini lived in that mansion. So for me. A, I'm trying to kind of write that wrong, and B, it's just me, you know, kind of telling stories like that, and uh, you know, and and at the same time, you know, engaging it, and, you know, putting that argument out, kind of like what I did with Seven Deadly Sins. Yeah, yeah. So Houdini Mansion, someone take that off Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I recently got the uh, the pleasure of speaking with Clown, and <laughs> oh, man, the pleasure in, in character. Yes, and he was telling me that uh, when it came to Slipknot's stage show, he Every time that he left the stage, finally felt like he had just come out of the hospital, <laughs> physically. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know: Do you feel that same way? And is playing with Stone Sour sort of a nice, breezy experience compared to the mayhem of Slipknot's live show? No, I mean my approach to live shows is very much the same. You know, I mean, with with Slipknot, it's a different level of intensity, obviously, but. For me, with both bands, it's like jumping out of an airplane, you know? I mean, you get that, which I have done, and uh, trust me, it didn't end well. Um, well, obviously, it ended well enough that I'm still sitting <laughs> here, but like... it was just a very, you know, for my first time, it was a bad experience. Um, you know, I throw myself into it no matter what I'm doing, you know? So with Slipknot, you know, it's, it's the level of intensity in the music that really gets me going, you know? Whereas... With Stone Sour, there's a lot more emotion, you know, there's a lot of different emotions going on. So I can kind of ghost in and out of those and, and really try to embrace the tone of the song. And there's so many different songs that we have with, with Stone Sour that it really kind of puts me through my paces. Yeah. And um, when I was talking with Clown, I, I sort of gave him a visual interpretation of what I thought of Slipknot show. I kind of likened it to a parasite. Because oh, you guys decent. are just like, it's very primal. You guys are like drooling on stage. You've got the crowd just completely controlled. And then he told me that he saw it as more of a, a car crash as well, like the entire <laughs> thing. I it sounds know, like what's something he would say. <laughs> How would you describe it? I would describe it, honestly, more cyclic in a way where 
if you look, if you were to watch a show from the side, so you could see the audience and the band at the same time, you could almost see the energy pouring in, and then the energy kind of coming right back out, you know. So it would be some type of vortex, or you know, kind of like just energetic or spiritual tornado in the air, you know, where we're feeding them and they're feeding us and it just keeps going and going and going until somebody finally breaks that chain. It would be like being in the eye of a storm and having your head ripped off, really, and then your head just, you know, just going a thousand miles an hour and then all of a sudden you just, it lands back on and everything's fine. You're just like, uh, all right. Oh, that's intense. And of course I have to ask, uh, are there any new Slipknot plans, an album, tour, anything you can do? We're doing us? five shows this year all overseas, um, but it's, it's, it's still not time yet. You know, uh, okay. There's a lot of people in the band getting healthy and, and trying to stay healthy. And uh, you know, I, I think by getting together and doing these, uh, this handful of shows, that will encourage them. And, that, and that's important you know, because it takes a long time to kind of pull yourself out of where we were. You know, we were all in really bad shape and really dark places and right now we, we just kind of realize it's like we don't want to be there anymore you know you can visit it you know you can visit it you can tap into it but you don't want to exist in it because that's not life that's just kind of sustaining pain and for me it's uh you know i kind of let that go a long time ago and now the rest of the guys in the band are kind of seeing that as well so we're all just kind of trying to be there for each other and whatnot and i think we'll start working on new music probably next year um just kind of you know throwing demos together maybe start work on a new album the end of next year or maybe 2015 great uh, uh, a more lighter topic I saw your appearance on Tosh.0 a little while oh, that's ago. lighter that's lighter <laughs> well you, you mean did the electrocution, get electrocution of Corey Taylor on Tosh.0 it was good times so. yeah I enjoyed myself I'm sure you did <laughs> was that uh, a pre-planned thing or did you just no, kind of that was how did he know that you were in the crowd well that day? we went with some good friends um, and uh, the, including Kerry King so we were all there together and uh we got to go backstage and, and uh, kind of see the writers area. And we met Daniel, who was yeah. super cool and was a, apparently a huge fan, which freaked me out. Wow! He was quoting Eyeless to me, like in my face. I was like, "That's the craziest thing that's ever happened." <laughs> that's great. You know. Um, but what they do is they shoot it twice. They shoot the show twice, you know, so they can like grab even better jokes and whatnot, and, and really kind of go for it. So it was in the middle. Of this, it was in between the first ta the first taping and the second taping, and there was this whole skit about the hands across America type of electrocution, and he was you know, he's like he just kind of stops and he goes, you know, maybe, you know maybe we'll get somebody out here to to you know we got the box somebody bring the box out and we'll see if we can get somebody to grab it and he looks right at me and I was like you've got to be kidding me, let me guess can I get a volunteer? <laughs> so of course no that happens. And he's like, you want to do it? And I'm like, you can't. I mean, there's a room full of people. And I'm like, what am I going to say? No, Christ. So I get up and I'm, I do it. And of course, I had to pick it up myself. So it was even worse, you know. And I made like 12 attempts to pick it up. And I finally grabbed it. And it's the most intense pain on the planet. I mean, and I like my muscles were so gnarly after that that I actually fell asleep with my fists like this, like they didn't let go until I woke up the next morning. So, go ahead, kids, mess around with electricity. It's good times. Well, you handled it like a champ. Uh, <laughs> good. And, uh, last question for you. Um, you know, uh, no matter how big you may get or, or how uh, legendary people think you are. Uh, as a musician, there's always going to be those people who you always put on a pedestal and, and in your own mind, no matter how good I get, I'll never be as good as this person. Mm -hmm. who, are, who are those people to you? Oh, for me? Um, oh, good Lord. That's a great question. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Bruce Dickinson comes to mind. I mean, that he's the man, you know, when it comes to, I mean, at his age, he's still doing it. I mean, just at the same level of energy and quality that he was, I mean, way back when I first heard Live After Death, for God's sakes, you know? Um, 
you know, I mean, there's there are the people who do, you know like at that level, and there's people who just feel like they're getting more and more creative, like uh, like Trent Reznor. You know, I mean, he's just the man. You know, I mean, everything he touches is so different, and unique, and so amazing. Um, but the thing that I really love the most is that you take a guy like Dave Grohl, who would have every reason in the world to be kind of stuck up his own ass, you know, and I mean, full of himself, and he is still just the nicest dude I've ever met, you know, and I, I take a lot of, uh, I take a lot of inspiration from that because I've always said there is room in every walk of life for manners, for class, to be a nice guy, you know, and to treat people well. And I see so many people in my line of work really not doing that, you know? So I'm like, well, screw that. I'm going to be the other end of the spectrum. And Dave Grohl lets me know that I'm on the right track. Right. Well, thank you again so much for your time. No worries. Get part one if you haven't already. Look out for part two, the comic, the shows, everything. There's a lot of stuff coming your way. Part two comes out April 9th. Part, uh, the, the first comic comes out April 17th. Pick it up. Right. Pick that shit up. Corey motherfucking Taylor. Hey. Hey, everyone. It's Gruhamid here from Loudwire. This is Corey Taylor, and this is the book. A funny thing happened on the way from heaven. Or way to heaven, duh. Well, but, uh, Evan was a person from my past. I don't like to talk about it, but that's that's fine. That's the next book. We'll skip that. Yeah, we'll skip that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the good stuff. And it's got a it's got a hell of a subtitle as well. It uh, does. I'll let you read it because I hate reading it. How I made peace with the paranormal and stigmatized zealots and cynics in the process. <laughs> so, uh, how exactly does one make peace with the paranormal? Uh, you, you essentially try to set out to you know get some answers that make sense to you, you know. I've, I've been, you know, I've been experiencing the paranormal for a very long time, and obviously I've, I'm quite on record as being a pretty devout atheist, if you can excuse that term. And, but at the same time, I've just kind of had this weird dichotomy all through my life where, you know, I, I don't believe in religion or, or that kind of the mythological side of this whole thing. And yet I've had these experiences, you know, and trying to trying to figure it out has been fairly infuriating. And none of the answers that were available were satisfactory to me. So this was me kind of trying to find a unique perspective on it, you know, and doing a lot of research uh, into you know, the scientific side of things and researching energy and how energy reacts and, you know, what laws govern energy and how many laws that the energy breaks on a daily basis. I mean, it was it was pretty cool to to be able to kind of make sense of things from a completely different standpoint. Sure. And and the book isn't just a uh, a compilation of scary ghost stories. No. It's also a, a study of religion and a study of self. Yes, uh, yes. Could you possibly talk a little about that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I do a whole chapter on why I, I've never, ex, you know, kind of let myself get involved with, with organized religion. And it's kind of been since a, an early age. Um, and, you know, not to offend anyone, it's just not been my thing, you know. And, and the thing that I learned was that, you know, man's fingerprints are more involved with religion than God's, you know. I, I think if if God was involved more with religion, I'd probably believe in him more. And yet, you know, religion as a whole is basically shot through man's prism and it just it doesn't make any sense. You can be in the same religion and people and people are on completely different pages. So it's like how can something that's supposed to unite people divide them so permanently in so many different ways? So that, you know, I, I kinda talk about that. I talk about you know, being more on the, the more on the common sense side of things, and yet knowing that I'm going to catch a lot of hell from skeptics, obviously. So, and that's one of the reasons why I went out of my way to kind of try and come at it from more from a more pragmatic point of view. You know, trying to, you know, come up with an idea of what these spirits are, and then try to explain it through scientific ways and and different things that I've been able to research. Yeah, and uh, I was really caught by uh, the first few lines in your book, if you don't mind. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you see them everywhere these days. You see them in movies and cartoons, advertisements, reality shows. Celebrities line up to tell their stories just so they have a good excuse to shiver and shake in their designer sports jackets. <laughs> um, so 
beginning with that line and going throughout the book, are you trying to distance yourself from the celebrity ghost stories and celebrity paranormal hunter whatever shows? That yeah, are out there? The, the 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 housewives of the paranormal states. <laughs> It's so stupid. I'd watch that one. It's so <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'd watch the first episode. Everything after that would be crap. Okay. Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's so, it's such a part of the zeitgeist these days. You know, whether it's the Paranormal Activity movies or, you know, the the Ghost Hunter show, the the original Ghost Hunters, which mm -hmm. was one of my favorites for a very long time, and still until they stopped getting away, they, they started getting away from the evidence and more into the reactionary side of things, where it's like, you know, they react to something off camera. It's like, oh, it's supposed to be scary. The first three or four years, you know, it was about the reveal with them. It was about the evidence. And that's why I watched it, you know? And the, the further get, they got away from that, the less and less I started watching it. Like, it just, uh, it's kind of a bum out. And that's me kind of trying to return to that side of things, where it's about, it's more about what you can prove than what you're reacting to off camera. I could react to something right now off camera, and you'd never know. You know why? Because there's no damn proof of it. It's like, ah, it's Betty Ross. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. You know, she's not making a flag. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and of course, it's not just celebrities who are sharing their ghost stories. It's also uh, people are becoming celebrities for claiming that they have some sort of connection to the paranormal. Yeah. So uh, what is your opinion on people like John Edward and the, like, the fucking Long Island medium oh Teresa was it Caputa I've oh. heard she's very nice uh, my mother-in-law works for an airline and uh, a bunch of people see, you know she flew in on like the airline and everybody said she was very lovely like I, I'm, I'm not talking about what she does I'm talking about who she is I mean she's very nice you, you know start screaming there's something on the wing of the plane some <laughs> thing <laughs> I'm sure she did you know but I mean, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't believe in that stuff. You know, like I, I never really have. I mean, if that's, if it's, if it's something that they truly believe in, who am I to disprove it? But at the same time, I don't believe in it myself. It's kind of like religion. It's like you can believe whatever the hell you want. I, I just don't subscribe to it. And I'm gonna do my very best not to make fun of you for it. I fail a <laughs> lot, but you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, John Edwards is just a tool. So, and you can fucking print that all right uh but you know despite i'm getting a p from over here i'm getting a p <laughs> from someone in some of the audience a p mean anything to you p p <laughs> yes honey the bathroom is just around the corner <laughs> there it's fine i am john edward so throughout the book um both as a child and as an adult yeah. it's very obvious that when you go into these situations that may be haunted or you have these paranormal experiences, you go through it with a great sense of, I think, bravery and enthusiasm. So, but besides that, is there any place where you would just never step foot into? Not really. I mean, I'm pretty open to go anywhere, you know, and once you get past the initial fight or flight reflex that we all kind of have you know I mean it's, it's it's unconscious it's 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 coded in our gene our DNA and, and it keeps us from you know running into swords face first you know I mean stuff like that once you get past that initial shock you can kind of get a handle on it and you start to kind of process it and look at it from a, a different perspective and that's what I've kind of tried to do over the years not that I've trained myself or anything like that I just I just have gotten to the point where I react to things like that for like completely differently so when I hear something or feel something or see something like that my initial reaction is is obvious you know it's just like oh god you know but then I just kind of get a grip on it and then I kind of go towards it and try to figure out what the hell it is hey everybody Guru Hamid here from Loudwire this is Corey Taylor, and the bad news is he probably hates you, as he will describe in You're Making Me Hate You, <laughs> the new book. Really, really good, honestly. I really enjoyed reading Thank this you. thing. Really, really funny. A great take on life and how one should and should not behave in public, and many, many more things. <laughs> the original subtitle, <laughs> which Honestly, was a joke. I know you're talking about the Nerdist interview, right? I believe it was yeah, that. Yeah. Now I can't say the title, but <laughs> if you would say it, I 
Uh, I, I believe happy. it was something like, or how many dicks Justin Bieber has sucked and lied about, or some shit like that. I believe it was a thousand. Sure. Yeah, it was like that. <laughs> <laughs> that that was, was yeah, that was a joke. And but honestly, I'm sure it wouldn't have gotten cleared either. But you know, right. Fuck it. <laughs> so if just just to say hypothetically, if it Give was it allowed for that to be the subtitle, would there be a chance? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, ah, perfect. Absolutely. Uh, that dude's got karmic fucking feedback coming out of his gooch right now. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever it takes to fucking bring him down a little bit, the more the better. Brilliant. Uh, so, you know, this is a bit different than your two other books. Mm. You know, first one, a bit more of an autobiography. Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, it was, it was a little more about just kind of just, you know, talking about the sins as they yes. partake to just everyday life and how antiquated thought can't really partake in modern living, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, seven deadly sins, and then uh, uh, what was it? a funny thing. Funny thing on happened on the way to heaven. Yes, <laughs> I was. The long titles just mm. boggle my mind. Uh, which was another great one about paranormal en encounters. Yeah. This one uh, a little more, just uh, kind of lighthearted. It's just me bitching, man. Yeah. Really, I mean, it's just me ranting. It's my old man shaking his cane at the kids <laughs> in the yard kind of book, and. Uh, You'd be surprised how many people agree with me. I thought I was going to get in a lot more trouble, and no. holy shit, dude. Like, I, it's ridiculous. I think a lot of people relate. And, and thank God. Yeah. I don't feel crazy now. <laughs> yeah, so with this book, was there a challenge in maybe writing a book that really you could have gone any direction with? I mean, the, the only challenge was making sure that you know, there were bursts of like angry kind of insight, but then okay. balanced with the fact that this is a book that I want people to enjoy. Like, it's not just all me, just, it's not a manifesto, let's put it that way. I wanted people to see the humor in it, you know? Because yes. that's, that was kind of the point, you know? I mean, the point of it was to write something funny and then have people go, <laughs> oh, you know? Yes. It's like, yes. it's, you know, that was, that's always been my favorite kind of comedy. It's the comedy that makes you think. You know, after you laughed your balls off, you walked away going, God, you know, he was right about that. So mm -hmm. this is kind of my attempt. I don't know if I pulled it off, but, you know, like a lot of people seem to enjoy it. So the balance was just kind of, you know, making sure I reined myself in and that I was able to kind of point that finger back at myself. Absolutely. So it didn't yeah. come off as, you know, self-righteous. Yes, you, you absolutely do not come off as infallible in the oh, book. thank God. <laughs> and, yeah. and you end up the book pot meat kettle yes and you pointed at yourself oh, uh, right. that must have been enjoyable for you to really just roast yourself and and honestly that's the tip of the iceberg I mean that was just kind of keeping it into one chapter I could have yeah. done a whole book about how <laughs> I'm just as much a fuck up as anybody else is so well, sure yeah man I mean that's the thing I mean you put yourself up on a pedestal too high the further down you're gonna fall you know and it seems like people who do that who have absolutely no flexibility in ego or you know, how they try to dictate their taste to other people. Those are usually the people who fall the hardest, you gotcha. know, that would have the, as just like, just as many skeletons in their closet as everybody else. And then when that statue falls over, it shatters into a million pieces. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna keep my feet on the ground and make sure people realize like, I'm just as dumb as everybody else. So I may be pissed, but maybe I'm just as pissed at myself as I am everybody else. They say that, uh, you know, every writer kind of has their voice. Yeah. But, uh, I think that you have many, many voices. Yeah. Uh, one of which I feel is a British man. Just because yeah, like your, yeah, your yeah. love of, of words and just language comes out in all these different ways. And, uh, you know, being kind of a man who's, who's traveled around the world and has been, you know, exposed to so many different cultures, has that sort of... Uh, Know, invaded your personal monologue in your head a little bit but yeah. I mean before that I mean I, I grew I'm a huge fan of British humor yeah. whether it's Monty Python or the young ones or you know or even going back to like beyond the fringe which oh, I listened yeah. to like when I was when I was younger I've always been kind of an anglophile you know like I've Absolutely. always kind of had this acerbic wit that kind of goes with the anger you know and I've just ha always had a way of kind of looking at things differently that has always kind of had an English bent to it. And you're the, the first person who's ever pointed that out, like other than my wife. 
You know, oh she's wow! Like, she's like, she's like, you were born in the wrong country, and I was like, I fucking know, <laughs> right? Uh, I think maybe one of the most pissed off chapters was probably the one where you were taking on the world of pop music and reality television <laughs> stuff yeah. like that. So with, with with that, was it difficult to, I guess, keep yourself back from just going as hard as you really wanted to, but you again, keep it yes, fun, keep it respectful, it must, uh, uh, to to a to a point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. You know, once again, I go off on these tangents and half the time I don't know if I'm making any sense because my head just spins <laughs> like a million miles an hour. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just kind of, you know, pointing around going, you suck, you suck, you suck. I wanted yeah. to give reasons why, you know, like that why music in today for the most part is garbage. Why television today for the most part is garbage. Why everything that we kind of look at for entertainment is just... It's almost insulting in its idiocy, you know? Mm. For me, it was more about, again, balancing the humor with the, 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 the rage pointing, you mm. know? And, and making sure that I didn't come off like a colossal prick. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who look at my music and everything I do, and it's like, well, you're part of the problem, dipshit. And I'm like, touche, fine, mm. see each his own. But at the same time, it's my book, not yours, so go fuck yourself. <laughs> there's a little quote I pulled from that chapter, which was, uh, you're talking about pop music, and you said that it makes you ashamed to be a singer, yeah. ashamed to be a songwriter, and what's worse is that you don't really know what to do about it. Yeah, yeah, there, there's those moments where, especially when I'm hanging out with my kids, and I hate to throw them under the bus, but oh, no. where they're kind of listening to what passes for popular music, and I'm just going, it's yeah. like, I, I think I even described it in the book, I feel like I'm being stunned by like a thousand bees all at once because it's just... It's painful. It's so auto-tuned and it's so beat-corrected and it's so canned and processed and lifeless. And I mean, you might as well be listening to a fucking piece of wood at that point. Mm. It bothers me because I put so much into everything I do. I put so much into my music. I bleed for it. I die for it every goddamn night, you know? And to watch these people basically let a computer go through the motions and do all the work for them, it's insulting to everyone out there who has more talent and less attention, you know? So then I, I kind of end up sit there just kind of stagnant in my rage, just going, well, what do I do? Everybody, I mean, you know, at this point, you know, the popular usage would dictate that that music is good because everybody listens to it. I yeah. think people listen to it because they feel like that's the only choice they have, you know? So I've been just slowly but surely kind of trying to put the message out there. It's like there's other types of music. There's better types of music. There's better musicians. There's better performers, better songwriters, better everything. Instead of this fucking Candyland, Disney, kid bop, fucking, God, uh, that's what I call bop. shit music, <laughs> volume 2007. It's fucking ridiculous. So uh. if I can get my voice through to 10 people out of 100, then hopefully I can turn things around. That's pretty good. I grew up with the kids, Bob. Right? Oh my God, I had to it. buy those for my kids. And I was like, this is abuse. <sighs> I'm not doing this to my fucking kids. You listen to Slayer and you love it. One thing about the new album I wanted to ask is that when the negative one came out, mm. a lot of people assumed that it was about Joey. <laughs> uh, you, know, be, you know, the term negative and because his number in Slipknot was one, um, you know, lots of different things. And mm. to you, when people were assuming that, you know, even though there are, you know, obviously references to Satan, you know, in, in the song. Sure. Um, what was your reaction to, I, I think, what was kind of like a wave of people who kind of had the same thought? I think somebody will, will, you know, there's a handful of people who have original ideas, and then there are millions of people who will pick up that original idea and just copy and paste it and put mm -hmm. it all over the place. A lot of people aren't brave enough to have their own opinion. So even though that opinion was incorrect, I could see how something like that could snowball and really roll downhill and, and just start picking up people and then getting louder and louder and louder. And it honestly wasn't until I came out and said something yes. that people started looking at it in a different light. Mm -hmm. You know. And honestly, I didn't even realize that you could have read it that way. Like, it was the furthest thing on my mind because, you know, none of the songs on there are about Joey. Yeah. All of the songs in there are about the band in general, you know, sometimes about myself, but also sometimes about 
just what we were going through, you know, when it, when it came to Paul and, and of his death. So for me, it was about the negative one and me, mm. which, you know, those two people fighting those sides of yourself where there's a part of you that just really misses your friend. And then there's the part of you that is so mad at your friend that it makes it hard for you to feel empathy which is very natural, especially when you lose someone the way we lost Paul. Yes. So it's dealing with very human issues, but it can go either way. It can go negative, it can go positive, but I can see where people would make that distinction, but it's incorrect. Being angry because of, of the way that he passed away, you know, I've, I've experienced that too. And yeah. there's definitely that feeling of like, I, I know it was for me, it was like, it's like, that's like, you, what the hell did you do that for, yeah. dude? Yeah. So. I mean, was that kind of the, the, the feeling you were trying to, to put into that song? A little bit, yeah. A little I bit. mean, mm -hmm. with, with Paul, honestly, it was, I mean, not to get too much into it, but it was, it was heart failure more than it was anything else. Oh, like, okay, yeah. Um, obviously, it was exacerbated by the things that he was doing. But what, you know, ultimately, the, the cause of his death was heart failure. So for me, it was like, there's a part of you that, understands that and hears it, you know, and understands the reality of it. But then there's the other part of it that is just like, God damn it. Yeah. If we, you know, if we had just worked together, if you could have just stayed healthy, if you could, you know, it's a lot of ifs that will fucking keep you awake at night and drive you absolutely insane. So, uh, you know, but it's part of the process. It's part of the grieving process. You know, you kind of have to snake your way through a landmine, a land field of, of emotions before you can kind of get to a point where you take a deep breath and go, okay, now what? And now what was us going into the studio? Uh, Randy Bly was in here recently, mm. and we were talking about his book. Yeah. Uh, he's going to come back soon to talk about his book. I can't wait to get my hands yeah. on that thing. It's really good. Uh, he was saying that he, um, along with yourself and some other musicians who have written books, he said that he, you know, kind of reached out to you for a little bit of help. You know, you said yeah. he was driving himself a little crazy with writing this thing. Can you tell me about um, sort of the advice that you gave him or maybe some of the discussions you had? I mean, one of the things I told him was just write, I just said, write it down. Like, no matter what it is, just write it down, you know? Because if you, if you hold yourself back because you're looking for that perfect sentence, you'll be sitting there forever, you know? Hmm. The best thing you can do is just kind of, you know, yeah. just, just vomit it out and, and write it down. And then you can go back and look at it and go, okay, well that works. Maybe not that. And the cool thing about Randy is he's so descriptive. Like he can, he has a, an ability to put you in the scene. Like he, he can put you in like with, you know, like with him when he was growing up, with him when he was in the prison, with him when he was coming out. It's, that's a very, very genuine gift. And I encourage everyone to read his book because it's a really oh, fascinating read. Can't wait. And, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, that was my only advice. It was just like, look, just don't worry about what's correct because you're going to fuck up. I mean, it's just like writing mm. your first song. Your first song oh, God. may or may not suck, but it's the second one that's important, you know? And once you get to that second one, you get to the fourth, to the eighth, to the sixteenth, and it's just exponential after that. So just write down what you're thinking. You can always take it away. It's easier to take away than it is to try and force yourself to do it because you'll be sitting there forever, you know, just spinning your wheels. And uh, so that was really the only thing I told him is like, be honest, um, paint the picture the way you want, but be honest about it. Don't be afraid to take people into dark places that maybe they don't want to go, but they need to go. <laughs>
Yeah, so I'm glad somebody changed that because it originally it used it was to be Corey wrong. Josh Taylor. Corey Josh I'm like, Taylor. I'm like, what? Mm. It's on my fucking driver's license for God's <laughs> sakes. Figure it out. I, that kind of makes me happy that they yeah. got it wrong oh, first. It's, it's so painful. It's, okay, all right, give me, give me. Also known as the Great Big Mouth, Faith. Okay, Faith. No, I didn't like, think that so. Was, <laughs> that was part of a conversation that got printed in Muse News, like. Mm. Years ago, which it was a local paper in Des Moines, like 20 years ago. Okay. And it, I don't know why, but it's been copied and pasted everywhere. <laughs> I've never been fucking called Faith. It's so stupid. Okay, that one's wrong. The Sickness. Sure. Todd Tigger. Yes, yes. <laughs> that would be my middle name and my first pet's name. So, oh, okay. And uh, I, I, I may or may not have engaged in... I was never going to yeah, play. let's not go this there. Is so stupid. <laughs> uh, the boogie night, absolutely, which we've seen with a and, K. Yes, and neck. Kind of there speaks you go. for itself. <laughs> it right. should have surround sound at this point. <laughs> uh, it says uh, early on you lived with uh, in Orlando briefly with your uncle George Robson. Though you were mostly raised by your mother in Waterloo, Iowa, in an old dilapidated farmhouse. Okay, let's just back up to Orlando right. and this person named George Robson. Your uncle, apparently. Mm, somebody's uncle, not mine. No fiction. Not one no. drop of that is true. What? I, I lived in West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay. I have never lived in Orlando. I do not have an uncle named George <laughs> Robson. And I did not live in Florida with an aunt or an uncle. My mom, my sister, and I, and my mom's boyfriend moved there for about a year or so when I okay. was like be between fourth and fifth grade. In fact, I didn't finish fourth grade because of because of the way we moved. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, half of that is true. I don't, where do they? Find but I did. I did live in Waterloo for about. Five years in an old dilapidated farmhouse. Well, at one point, yeah. At one I mean, point, I lived okay. in eight different places in, in Waterloo. Ah, yeah. Okay. We, we moved around a lot, mainly because we couldn't pay the rent. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, it says you developed a fond feeling towards classic rock after your grandma introduced you to it. Sure. It's the yeah. most general <laughs> statement. There wasn't a moment. My where... grandmother played Elvis for me. Okay. Um, so I got into yeah, Elvis and Jim Reeves. I don't know if she was a huge Boston fan or anything oh, like that. Right. She'd probably tell you Boston was a city, not a band. But ah. I mean, it's who the fuck writes these? I don't know. Really? That's why we do it. All right. Hey, this is why we do it. <laughs> this is why we do it. <laughs> yeah, dude, do yeah. it. Uh, by age 15, said you had developed a drug addiction and had overdosed on cocaine twice. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, okay. I started doing coke when I was, well, I started smoking weed when I was 12. Mm, um, okay. Started smoking cigarettes when I was 10. Um, started, yeah, I started doing coke and speed when I was about 13. By the time I was 15, uh, I had OD'd twice. I actually, I woke up in a dumpster because uh, I was at a party and I, I guess I OD'd. Um, and instead of taking me to the hospital, they, they threw me in a dumpster. So I kind of woke up, and I think because of that, it jostled my system and actually kind of helped me survive. And I woke wow. up, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I went back to my house. And shortly after that, we went to visit my grandmother in Des Moines, and I ended up staying and never going back. So oh, okay, pretty so crazy. That kind of goes <coughs> into the next one here. It said you later set out on your own and ended up at your grandmother's trailer in Ohio. And it says she took legal custody okay, of you. Okay, freeze. Ohio. Ohio. My grandmother's never lived in a trailer. She's had the same house for 40 years. In Iowa? Actually, more than 40 years. In Iowa. Iowa, yes. Yeah. Not Idaho, not Ohio, <laughs> Iowa. It's on a fucking map, people. Come on. It's not that hard. Oh, boy. Continue. All right. She took legal custody of you. Yeah. Okay. So I could go to, so, so I could go to school. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that gotcha. was the only reason, yeah. And helped you buy musical equipment. She did, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sad to say that I still owe my grandmother oh. quite a bit of money. Oh. But at the same time, I, I think I've paid her back because I've, I've helped her out over the years with, with a lot of stuff. And, uh, 
And I mean, just in the platinum plaques alone, I think mm. she's she's like she's got fine. a few of those. We're fine. Oh yeah. I used to get I used to get my grandmother a copy with with every one that we'd get. Oh and wow. And then it suddenly her house was full of them, and she's like, "You can stop now <laughs> because I have nowhere else to put them." She's still got a stack in one of her spare bedrooms. She's wow. like, "I don't know where to put this. I'm putting glasses on it for it's ridiculous." So she's still around. Oh yeah. That's yeah. awesome. My grandmother is 88. And will be 89 oh, wow. this year, and uh, still works. She worked for 25 years at one place, retired. Took a year off, got bored, went back to work. She's been working there for 24 years. <laughs> wow. She's a fucking maniac. You wonder where <laughs> I get it? My grandmother, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and up and, and still basically drives herself off and on. Even though wow. she has to wor- walk with a cane and a, or, or a walker sometimes, yeah. She's so pissed uh, that she had to give up bowling because of her legs. <laughs> she was mad, dude. I mean, this is a oh. woman who's got stacks of trophies. Like, she was on a league for years. She used to take me out with her on the road when she would go and play, like, do, like, leagues in, like, different cities and shit. Damn. My grandmother's fucking rad, dude. So you witnessed this. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Saw it, man. She could roll. She could roll. She could roll the pill. It was nice. She had a good curve. Yeah. Beautiful. That's awesome. I'm glad she's still around. Yeah. She's fucking amazing. <laughs> uh, to, in your early 20s, when you were living with your gram, uh, you attempted suicide by way of overdose. Um, your grandmother drove you to the hospital in Des Moines, which is in Iowa, not Ohio. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, the doctors resuscitated you, and you described this as the lowest point in your life. Yeah, it was pretty low. Um, and, you know, obviously, well, it was, I was 18 going on 19. Um, okay. So it was a little earlier than that. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I swallowed a bunch of pills. And my ex-girlfriend's mother came to check on me, found me, took me to the hospital. They fed me Ipecac. Oof. Yeah. Okay. Which is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. For about five years, I couldn't eat pancakes because it <laughs> tastes like maple syrup. And because it, it induces vomiting yes. quite readily, there mm-hmm. was no way I was eating pancakes for a while. Then they give you this liquid charcoal that yes. soaks up your stomach and, and gets you to settle down. So I was laying, I was laying in the hospital. My grandma came and got me, and then she brought me home. She was very, I'm obviously very disappointed. And I kind of laid on the couch for a while, and the VMAs were on. And wait, do you remember what year? Uh, it was '91, I think. '90 or '91. Okay. It was the year that Faith No More first played, and it was ep- they played Epic, and it awesome. was awesome amazing and it kind of re-energized my whole will to make music like they were so good and they were so powerful and it was so different than anything I'd ever seen you know that they really kind of got me up off my ass and that's when I started writing again started kind of you know making music again so if it wasn't for faith no more I wouldn't be here well thank you boys uh, it says you met your father for the first time as an adult, yeah. and that you... I was 30. 30, okay. Yeah. You now have a relationship with him, although you've said your paths do not cross all that often. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he has his own life, I have mine. Um, yeah. We, you know, we touch base, you know, it's, he's very much like me, you know, like, it's, sometimes it's just, I'm one of those people who's very comfortable in his own skin. Like, I don't need a lot of company. I don't need a lot of anything. You know, I can kind sure. of do my own thing and be all right. And he's kind of the same way. So every once in a while, you know, we kind of touch base and, and make sure everybody's good and, you know, toes and fingers are all accounted for. <laughs> and other than that, you know, it's all good. Cool. Uh, it says that, you know, it, with past alcohol abuse problems, uh, yeah. your wife at the time, Scarlett, helped you through uh, tremendously as well as keeping you from committing suicide, uh, you said that, it said rather, that you had attempted to jump off an eighth floor balcony of the Hyatt on Sunset Boulevard in 2003, but somehow she stopped you. But then there's a contradiction that says uh, your friend Tom Hazard stopped Tom you. Tom Hazard. Tom yeah, Hazard. Biggie T, yeah. If he hadn't grabbed me by the shirt, I would be a splatter on the, uh, on the pavement. So, yeah. so it was him who physically him, stopped yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I woke up the next day and I was like, I'm, I'm done, you know. That, that was the first time, like, I really committed myself to, to cleaning up. You yes. Know? And I was, I was clean for about three years, started drinking again for maybe three years, and then 
I quit again about six years ago, and I've been I've been clean ever since. So the lyrical concept of Eeyore describes your feeling against a man who issued a death threat to you during a Slipknot concert. No, that's not true. <laughs> it's about this one dude who used to be in every mosh pit at every metal show. He was this gigantic blonde dude, who, long blonde hair, and we called him <laughs> Thor, and he was a fucking asshole. Oh. So one night, like just a bunch of people, he, I mean, cause he would be throwing elbows, he wouldn't help people up. He was the dick in the pit. Like, let's put it that way. Everybody mm. knows that one dick in the pit. So one night, everybody got around him and they fucking housed his ass. Like they worked him out and he, he wasn't <laughs> in the pit for a while, you know? Shit happens, too bad it happened down your leg, bud. Ah. And that's what that song was about, because I was there and I watched it, it was brutal. Oh boy. But uh, he learned his lesson, and there was uh, much more respect in the pit after that. And it was, oh, you it was did see him cool. after? Oh yeah, yeah, he came oh. back. Yeah, I mean, we didn't kill him. Yeah. We're not fucking assholes, <laughs> you know? We just maimed him. And he learned. He did learn. Cool. Sometimes you have to learn, Thor. Sorry. <laughs> During the Iowa recording sessions, the Slipknot members, uh, the relationships with each other started to suffer, and this has been described as the darkest time of the band's career. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. And, and it wasn't because necessarily we were growing apart, we were just all very chemically imbalanced. I mean, to put it lightly, we were all fucked up. You know, we were kids who were suddenly famous, and we became every cliche that we hated, you know? Like, it was a bum out, you know? Mm. we. We fought every cliche leading up to getting signed and going out and playing shows. And then all of a sudden, we had everything. We had a double platinum album. We we're the, one of the biggest metal bands in the world. We were headlining because nobody wanted us to open for them. Very true. And we were making our, a hugely, hugely anticipated album. So we just started getting fucked up. Because yeah. we were from Iowa and we were crazy people, you know? So. In a way, we kind of, it was a pitfall that we fell into and then slowly but surely we kind of tried to pull ourselves out of it and sometimes it's hard, you know, especially when you're, you know, hitting the shit as hard as we were, you know, I mean, because we were working hard, we were playing hard, we were just crazy hard. Yeah. Uh, the Heretic Anthem, it said that song was written about record labels who initially showed no interest in signing a contract with Slipknot. Yeah, yeah, we were okay. actually, essentially, I mean, here's a funny story. We were signed, originally, we were supposed to sign with Sony Records. And oh. we did a showcase in Vegas. I remember it was the Edom Festival, the first and only Edom Festival. And it was done at GameWorks down on the Strip. Very strange place. <laughs> uh, they set up this little pit pit stage that we couldn't even fit on. So half of us played on the floor with the pit, yeah. right? <coughs> Head of A&R from Sony shows up and is watching us <laughs> like this. Goes back to Sony Records, and this is a true story, there was a memo that went out basically saying, do not sign this band. He said, if this is the future of music, I don't want to be alive. I think so, I may have heard that. Luckily, Roadrunner picked us up. Long story short, when we went platinum, we sent him a bouquet of dead flowers, <laughs> dead roses. Basically said, we are the future of music and we want you dead. Ooh. Sincerely Slipknot. Wow. Thank you for not fucking our lives up by signing us, you douchebag. Volume three. Working out the differences uh, between band members hindered the writing process initially. Uh, you guys talked to each other, or, or didn't talk to each other, for roughly three months, uh, though you were living together in the famous Houdini mansion. Well, the mansion. There's a big misnomer about that. Like, the, Houdini never lived in that house. Right. Ever. Like, he didn't, even live, he didn't even live close to that house, and neither did his wife. Hmm. So that's kind of a, a, that's kind of a, a misconception that it's I've kind been of trying nickname. to fight. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's an incorrect nickname, isn't it? Okay. You know, would you Stop want me to call it. you Joseph if your name wasn't Joseph? Probably not. There you go. Let's figure it the fuck out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the crazy thing about the first three months is like, not only was I fucked up, but everybody was fucked up. And, we were kind of in and out, you know? Like we weren't hanging together. We weren't working on anything together, you know? And then slowly but surely, you know, I, you know, I quit drinking and, and was a little more involved, but slowly but surely the music really kind of started to come together, you know? And this is where Paul and Joe really, you know, they, you know, they were ahead of the game as far as like bringing music in, bringing uh, Vermillion, uh, Duality, 
uh, Before I Forget. Like, I mean, a lot of like the really good stuff. And then the more involved we got, the more music came out of it. So it, it slowly but surely started to kind of get there, you know. But it took seven months, man. It was, it was crazy. Cool. Uh, it says for the All Hope Is Gone record, uh, it said that being close to home was good for your mindset and you drove home every night to see your son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It was good being in Iowa. Um, I mean, it was a hard album to make in retrospect um, because it, mm. once again, I mean, there, there was just something going on and we all kind of pulled apart. Um, but going home and being able to be a father every night was really, really gratifying, you know? And uh, it, it, just, it just felt good, you know? I mean, as I've gotten older, my priorities have completely changed, you know? And for me, even though I love making music, you know, I, I mean, music can come and go as far as I'm concerned because I'm always going to be a dad, you know? So it's, you kind of have to pay a little more attention to that because there are people who rely on you and there are people who look up to you and there are people who need you. So for me, I'm a little more focused on that sometimes than I am on the music, which, you know, rightfully so. Yeah. Uh, this is one that's been like weirdly debated by a lot of different people. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. It, it says you recorded 10 original songs with Velvet Revolver, but it's unlikely that the tracks or some people call it like a demo will ever be released. Um, I think it was 10. I think it was, I, I, it's either 9 or 10. Um, there, were, there was a handful that we wrote, um, mm -hmm. and then there was a handful that I kind of rearranged a little bit based on music that they already had. So okay. it wasn't music that we kind of wrote together. I mean, there were like three, I think there was three songs that we wrote together, which were actually pretty sweet. And then the rest of it was me writing to music that they already had, you know, that I thought was pretty cool. Um, yeah, the, the world will probably never hear them, um, which is fine because, I mean, I would want a, you know, another crack at kind of working on some of that stuff anyway, hmm. but that'll never happen. So it's... You know, it's all good. You've said that the two newest members of Slipknot, uh, they got a crack at designing their own masks and failed miserably, and the masks they now wear uh, were designed by the band. Yes, that is that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, and I, I mean, in, in all fairness, it, like, like I said before, with the, with the latex and the makeup, it's not like I nailed it the first <laughs> time. You kind of have to learn the Slipknot way. There's just a mindset that goes into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Not everybody comes in just knowing how to get it, you know? I think the only one who really did was Sid. When he joined, he just got it, you know? But he's mm -hmm. fucked up anyway, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, and maybe it didn't look as cool on paper as they thought it was going to, but hmm. by that point, it was like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna show you a little bit. We're gonna guide you through and give you something to work with, okay. and 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 that was it, you know. And then we told him it's like, look, you can you can do whatever you want with this, and you can kind of make it your own. But this is what you get right now, you know. Like as you learn and as you kind of figure out the mindset, it'll kind of guide you towards you know how we look at things and how we do things and how we see it because it's all about looking outside the box, you know. And what they had come up with was, was kind of cartoony. It wasn't bad, but it was just really cartoony, you know? And, okay. and we try to stay away from that as much as possible, you know? Be as artistic as you want, but you've always got to rub some rust on the skin before it'll fucking inflame, you know? So that's the way you kind of have to do it. This was a damn good episode. Oh, good, I gotta good. say, I think it was awesome. So it went well? Yeah. Okay, uncomfortable totally. thumbs up. Uh, enjoy, kids. This has not been edited a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Corey. Very cool. Totally appreciate no it. Worries, man. This is the new book, You're Making Me Hate You. Pick it up now. It's available. Corey Taylor, everybody. Corey Taylor of Slipknot and Stolen Sour with us. How are you doing? I am moist. Moist. It's, Moily, it's as nice we to say. see you in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. It is moist here. It's I'll, nice to smell me in yeah. Jacksonville, I, I, Florida. I've been telling everybody who's coming within any like three feet, to, yeah. don't smell me. Oh no, you're fine. You're All fine. Right. I, I, I'm, I, on the other hand, am, I've, I've been declared a, a toxic waste dump at this point. <laughs> it's brutal. So, and then putting the crap on later is, oh god, I don't know how my wife even looks. Do at you me. ever like? Do you guys ever like walk through a like a car wash to wash? No, no, like, no, no, <laughs> no. I mean that would be silly. I mean that would be just you know, so it you would just... be smart, but it would be silly. So you just stink. You just we just stink. yeah, we just we just moil it up. You know, we get all oogie. 
down there. Yeah, Oogie. it's gross. I like that. Oogie. <laughs> I like Oogie better than moist. Oogie. Moist is such yeah, well, a moist, gross moist word. is one of those words you either dig or you don't. You it's know? like, a like moist. I say. I know a friend of mine who really hates it, so I'm gonna probably say it a lot and then send him the link to this. <laughs> moist. Yeah. Uh, so Corey Taylor with us. You're in Slipknot mode, even as Stone Sour has a new EP that was yeah. just released. What's most confusing about being in two active bands at the same time? Um. Nah, it's, it's it's actually it's easier than you think, you know, because then you show up and it's like a totally different group of people. It's like, oh yeah, I know you people. Yeah, <laughs> this is fine. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's you know, musically, it, it keeps me so in tune because I I know there's a certain style that Slipknot has, and then there's a certain style that Stone Sour has. So I can kind of you know, I I it's very easy for me to get in the mindset with with either one very quickly. The new Slipknot album uh, couldn't have been easy to make, Point Five, The Great Chapter. What's the hardest way uh, casualties, literally and figuratively, yeah. force a band to reevaluate itself? Um, it's, it's a painful process, you know. Um, it's, it's, I don't wish it on anybody. Um, but when you have something like Slipknot that you, know, you kind of all have to take a look at and go, you know, we still want to do this and we, we still want to do this a certain way it's hard you know like you have to you 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 know a you're dealing with the the loss of your brother b you're 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 parting ways with someone who was a a, a huge part of this band and it's like okay how do you fill in the blanks you know and 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 at the same time you know tell a tell the story of, of the loss of that person you know and and really try to work it out musically um it was tough but we uh you know we we did the best we could, and uh, I I feel like it's probably our strongest album in a long, long time, and it's it's uh, it was a statement. For you per personally, Corey, what would have been your biggest regret if you hadn't made Point Five the Great Chapter? Um, probably not getting to say enough about what Paul meant to me. You know, it's only in retrospect that we really realize you know, what we had until it, it's taken away from us. And when Paul died, it really, it, it readjusted me in a huge way, man. Um, not only in the way I am towards life and towards my career, but just how I am towards the people that I care about, you know? So I've, I've kind of retroactively been trying to give Paul as like the credit that he was due for years, you know, because when you're younger and there's just this level of selfishness that you're so afraid to, to, to let go of, you know, people have to know like what you did. And as I've gotten older, I realize that's just such weak sauce, you know, like it's, it's, it's actually stronger to give the credit to the people who it's due, you know? And my only regret is that I didn't give it to Paul when he was alive, you know, and now I'll, I'll have to live with that. But now with this album, you know, it was very important for me to kind of share that and, and share the the emotions that we all kind of went through when we lost him, and and uh, to just you know dedicate an album to a person who was such a huge part for us, you know. Slipknot Summer's Last Stand tour kicks off July twenty fourth. Yes. Talk about uh, the package you put together. I mean, huge. Yeah. It's really good. Lineup. It's kind of our fu to the pop world, you know. <laughs> like everybody says that you know rock is dead, metal is dead. And I'm like, really? Then that zombie's gonna bite you in the face, you know. So. <laughs> Uh, this is our way of, of putting together, uh, you know, a package with some bands that we absolutely love. You know, not only uh, um, uh, Bullet for My Valentine, but Lamb of God and Motionless and Wyatt, which is a great newer band. You know, it, it's it's just a package that kind of represents what we're all about. You know, and going out and you know sharing the stage with with you know some friends and some people who you know have, you know kind of grew up listening to us. It's it's kind of a big deal. You know, so we're. We're trying to wear the, the, the medal with pride. I, I got a chance to talk to Chris Motionless earlier, and he is so psyched yeah. about that tour. Good. Oh, my gosh. He's good. counting good. down. He's good. like, I can't believe this is happening. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good kid, man. He's a yeah. really nice dude. And he really I, yeah, is. He really is. I mean, you can see that he, he's passionate about it. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we wanted to take those, those guys out because they mean it, you know. And not a lot of people in this world mean it anymore, and they really want it. So 
you know, whatever we can do to help. Uh, we've been talking to bands today about a couple of anniversaries that are coming up this summer. Um, first off, May 16th marks five years since the world lost Ronnie James Dio. Yeah. Can you talk about what his music and talents meant to you personally and to the metal scene in general? And if you have like a personal story of meeting him or seeing him perform live? You know, Ronnie was one of those guys that just made it look so easy. You know, it like it, it made you hate him it, like a little bit. You're just like, oh, really? Because he would basically he'd just kind of go, ah, and then he'd go, all right, I'm ready to go. And he'd just walk on stage, and it's just magic every night, you know? He was one of the most wonderful, warm, funny, coolest people on the planet. You know, I had, I had the, uh, the pleasure of meeting him, like, a handful of times, and I was actually a part of one of his last interviews, you know? And uh, he was so gracious and so respectful, and he, he just looked so, you know, he was... He was fighting it, but he looked, you know, he was ready, you know. So when when he passed, I was so heartbroken. Um, and he, but, you know, we still have his music. And I kind of take cues from people like that now, you know. Like, I look back at how gracious he was and how cool he was. And I go, if Ronnie James Dio can be that way, why can't I be that way? And I kind of, you know, I, I try to tear down people who maybe put themselves up a little higher than other people because there's no reason for it, you know? This is all one big family, and you think you're better than me, there's no reason for that. Ronnie James Dio was a legend, full stop, and if he could go out of his way to make people all around him feel better, then, you know, there's no reason that you can't. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think we should make a new saying of, like, what would Ronnie James Dio do? What would Ron yeah, <laughs> W-W-R-J-D-D-D, -D. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a big bracelet, and, but we could put studs on it. Yeah. Like it'd be oh, yeah. rad. Like little devil horns. Yeah, we put a devil fish on it. <laughs> hey, what up? This is Corey Taylor from Slipknot, and you are watching Loudwire. You've talked about some upcoming acting gigs you have. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Can you share any of that with us? And if not, that's fine. Uh, but do you see more acting in your future? Is that something? I would love about? to do more acting. In fact, oh, if anybody okay. you know listening or watching. <laughs> I would love to audition for your weird indie horror movie. I'll be zombie number six. I'm totally down. I'll bring my own lunch. You don't have to worry about craft services. I'm all good. Um, I, uh, I'm actually, I have a, a, a little role in Clown's movie, uh, Officer Down, uh, that is actually going to be debuting, I think, at the Arclight in June, which is pretty rad. You know, actually not too long, like about five weeks it's something he was very passionate about. He worked his ass off, and I know because I watched him. He's uh, he did really, really well just from some of the stuff that I've seen in passing. Um, so I'm really stoked for him. His first big movie, you know, they're gonna be able to watch it in a theater, which is huge. Other than that, um, I shot a, a cameo for. I don't even know if I could talk about this, you but cool. all right, I shot it. I shot it. I shot a weird cameo in Sharknado 4, which is yeah. awesome, so rad. And it's like, I don't, but the thing is, I, I don't even get ate by a shark, man. Like, I just, I kind of run in like I'm, I'm a security guard, and like, it's funny. It's, that, that's all I'll tell you about it. But oh, that's awesome. I did that. I got a couple other things that's going on, but I'm always looking to do more because I just, I love it. I have so much fun doing it. And, uh, and it's like if my uh, if my schedule permits, I'm I'm always down to do anything. I want to make sure I get this correct. Uh, you tweeted out that the stuff you're writing for Stone Tower, Unreal, some of the best you've written, worked on. Oh yeah. What can you tell us about the direction of the upcoming album, and do you have a timeline established yet? Right now, we're uh, we're kind of taking our time because the rest of this year is uh, touring with Slipknot off and on. Um, but the cool thing is, we're getting together like every couple months and like you know writing songs and stuff. Right now, we have about. I want to say 15 that are really, really strong. We're going to do another 10, see where we're at. Timeline-wise, hopefully get into the studio either January or February next year. Get that together in a couple of months and then try to get the album out by the summer. And uh, it's amazing. The stuff we're writing right now, it's got elements of metal. It's got elements of hard rock. It's got elements of punk. It's got, it's got all these things that we all love and we all share. And we're just kind of, you know, just kind of shoving it through the Stone Sour, you know, funnel and seeing what happens. And it's all really, really, really good. As fate would have it, you performed in Minneapolis um, as Word of Prince's Death was yeah, spreading. Yeah. Um, what was it like performing in his hometown, his music on that night? I mean, it was heavy, you know. I, uh, you know, it was one of those things where as a fan, you're kind of knocked back a lot. And you're just like, oh, my God. 
And then it kind of slowly dawns on you. It's like, oh, Christ, I'm playing First Avenue in Minneapolis the day that Prince died. Like, you kind of either crumple or you rise to it. And for me as a fan, there was no way that I was not going to show my respect for him Be just for the fact that I loved everything that he did, you know? So I wanted to walk out on that stage, no words, play the song, have all of us kind of come together and share that moment because I knew there were people in that audience hurting like I was. And it was the exact right thing to do. And, you know, I'm just very humbled that I was there on that night. Tony with Corey Taylor of Slipknot, Stone Sour, author, actor, DJ now. We could go on and on oh, and please, on. please, go on. It's I such we'll a long stop. list. It's okay, that yeah, National Concert Day? Yeah. All right. Thank Still you. trying to figure that one out. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so Slipknot about to go on the road with Marilyn Manson. Yep. Manson came on the scene a few years prior to Slipknot. Yep. Was he ever an influence on the band early years or you individually? Well, he's definitely an influence on me. I mean, I was a huge Manson fan, starting with Portrait, honestly. And uh, I just, he just got better and better with every album. So for me, even if, it, even if I wasn't doing the same musical style, that reactionary vibe and the way he could turn it, he could turn phrases artistic and yet still have it be powerful and meaningful. That was a huge, huge influence on me as a writer, you know. So to this day, I still, I, I think Antichrist Superstar is still one of the best albums ever recorded, bar none. Do you have a fun or funny or exciting Marilyn Manson story you could share with us? <laughs> Maybe something that's One that I can tell? Like, yes, uh. please. Well, I tell you what, okay. Now, mind you, we haven't really toured together since 2001, which when we did OzFest. We had a, we had a, a dressing room right next to him. And one day we were getting ready because we went we not we went on before him, you know. So we're all getting our stuff, you know, putting the makeup on, putting the masks on, and all of a sudden here comes Marilyn running through our dressing room in nothing but tight white underwear, just kind of waving his eyes like, "What's up, guys?" And scared the crap out of. We were just like, "What the hell?" And that he just kind of he just went away, and we're like, "Well, what?" That door goes outside, and we look out, and he's just running through security. Now I was just like, "What?" Jesus Christ! All right, so it was uh, it was a bonding moment. Were we talking boxers briefs? Oh no 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 no! There's Fruit of Looms, <laughs> probably his most beloved underwear as well. Like you could tell, like it, he, he'd 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 worn, he'd worn them for a while. Recently, Rob Zombie said that grunge was the death of the larger than life rock star, with the exception of Slipknot. How does it feel to have Rob Zombie single out your he band? He said that. that? Way? Yeah, he did say that. <laughs> All right. Thoughts Thanks, on that? Rob. That's crazy. I, I did not know he said that. Um, I can see that in a lot of ways. Um, but at the same time, it's a weird, it's kind of a weird time for rock right now anyway, you know, because, you know, we kind of ebb and flow every 15 years, you know. Right now we're kind of on the uprise again, kind of coming back. So it's going to be interesting to see who takes the, you know, takes the flag and starts waving it, and, you know, those big personalities start coming out. It's going to be it's going to be great, you know. We're going to have a whole other generation of huge rock bands to really kind of fly the flag. So it, I appreciate Rob saying that. Um, and I'll keep waving it as long as I can, but you know, somebody's got to take it and you know, can't keep running the distance. My knees can't take it anymore. I'm just telling <laughs> yeah, you right now, too. It's I happen. am broken in a lot of different ways. I mean, I can still, you know, I can still get in it, but my knees, not so much. I can't, yeah, I can't do that thing. Recently, NWA were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall yeah. of Fame, right? Yeah. So, and Gene Simmons has been very verbal about the fact he doesn't believe that they should be there. Yeah. Uh, they've been going back and forth, trading insults. What are your thoughts on that situation and Gene Simmons' thoughts on that? I mean, it's, I see what Gene's saying. And, you know, I'm an old school guy as well. I get it. But at the same time, the more I look at what NWA did, man. I mean, they influenced me, and I'm a rock and roll guy, so how do they not deserve to be in there, you know? To me, bands like that, bands like Run DMC, you know, that's it's a different type of band, but that's a band, man. I mean, that's straight up. So I can see both sides of it, but if, if I have bigger problems with the Hall of Fame than 
some of the people who have gone in. Uh, mine has more to do with the fact that until this year, Cheap Trick and Deep Purple weren't in. That to me is disrespectful on a whole other rel level, you know? Does NWA deserve to be in? God damn right they do. But did Cheap Trick and Deep Purple deserve to be in years before they got in? You damn right they did. So that whole organization needs to figure out who they're gonna honor and when because there are still bands right now who aren't in that should be. We do ask everybody to uh, share a memorable Ozzy Osbourne story with us if they have one. I, the first time I met Ozzy Osbourne, he made my life. And uh, I was sitting at a table, it was OzFest 99. I was sitting at a table with Sharon and Jack, a couple of the other guys in the band. Um, and Jack was really the whole reason that we were on OzFest 99, he was a huge fan, talked his mom into bringing us on, and you know, if it wasn't for that tour, we wouldn't have been able to do what we've been able to do. And out of nowhere, here comes Ozzy, you know, Ozzy's like, you know, Sharon, I need help with, you know, this, and she introduced us, and he goes, oh, you're in Slipknot? He's like, there's nine people, right? He's like, I want to be number 10. and. He gave me a huge hug, and it was like being baptized and knighted all at the same time. Like, you know, because, I mean, this is a guy that I have looked up to and listened to my whole life, you know. And for him to kind of give me that moment, and you know, he didn't really have to, was huge, and I've, I've never forgotten. Oh, man, what fucking year was it? I want to say 95, I was living in Denver and we were watching MTV, which showed music back then, good music. And um, the video for Clown came on and I was like, what the f <laughs> I'm, you know, color in your own expletive. But I was blown away, you know, like, it was so different and it was so heavy and dark and like brutal in a way that I hadn't heard in a long time, you know? So um, it really caught me by surprise. And just it just so happened that they were opening for Megadeth on that tour and they were playing the Gothic Theater. And I was able to get tickets with some friends of mine and go and see them. And I mean, it was, I, the only thing that I can describe it because the excitement in the room was so palpable. The only way I can describe it was the same way when I saw Guns N' Roses open for Aerosmith in 88, 87, 88, somewhere in there. And I never felt a surge like that. So being in that and feeling that in the air, man, it was probably one of the best concerts I'd ever seen, you know? And the next, very next day, I went out, and bought the like the first album, and I was a fan ever since. And then, you know, over the years, obviously, we've done shows together in both of my, you know, musical iterations, and getting to know these guys and getting to be friends with these guys has been an absolute gift, you know, like absolute honor, because it's not a lot that you see a band as gifted and as special as this band, and get to relate to them on a personal level. So I'm very, very lucky, you know? Um, and I can tell everybody that they are just as down to earth and awesome as you think they are. Like it's, it's fucking special. Dude, trust me, it, I'm so excited about it that if I didn't think I'd get in fucking trouble, I'd play it for you right now, like for real. Um, I am, beyond excited. Um, everyone that we have talked to has just been blown away by it. And that to me is, is so amazing to feel because you put a lot of work into it, you care. Um, this is the first time we've really co-produced and uh, really did it. And it came out so far beyond our expectations that now we just can't wait to share it with the, the world. It is flat out rock and roll in its best form. I know that I know rock and roll is kind of a dirty word these days. A lot of people don't want to 
you know, be lumped in with that. Well, screw that. We're kicking those fucking walls down. Stone Sour is a rock and roll band that can play everything. And this album is going to prove it. This is the best album we've ever done. Hey, it's Tony for Loudwire, and we're out here at Rock on the Range with Corey Taylor. Thank you so much for your time, Corey. Oh, it's good to see you guys again. Always a pleasure for us. Yeah. So I was at your sold out Stone Sour oh, show. You're there. I was Very totally good. there. Good. Very good. Which I heard sold out in like 15 minutes. That yeah. has to feel amazing. It's pretty rad. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we haven't played a show in like four years and it sold out that quick. I mean, it was, I mean, that was heartwarming. And we sold it out on our own. Like, there were no other bands announced or anything. And it was just like, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty rad. I thought one thing that, well, a lot of things stood out about that show. But one thing that really stood out is your appreciation for the fans. You don't just say, I appreciate fans. Like, before that show started and the comedians came out to warm everybody yeah. up, you came out and oh, yeah. you yeah. thanked everybody. And that was pretty special, I thought. Well, you know, I've, I've always had a connection with our fans, you know, and I, and I don't know if that's why they've been with us for so long or if that's why they've stuck with me for so long, but I just, I still, I still identify as a fan, you know, I, I still love music as much as I have loved, like, since I was a kid, I still love making music as much as I wanted to since I was a kid, so in a lot of ways, I'm a reflection of them and they're a reflection of me, you know, like the guy who you know, basically won the lottery and gets to do what he loves for the rest of his life, hopefully, and then still appreciate music the way I did when I was younger, you know? So I think that's something that they really, they can identify with and it endears me to them, maybe. Maybe it's just because I'm funny looking. I don't really know. But uh, I'm gonna, you know, hopefully I didn't jinx myself on that. I don't think you did. <laughs> Um, the band did an amazing, beautiful cover of Outshine. Well, thank you. What did it feel like to perform that song on stage on that night? And also, what did Chris Cornell's music mean to you? I mean, it was, thank you for that, by the way. I mean, that song is no joke. It's hard. It's you really, learned it that day, you said? We learned it that day, yeah. And it's it's difficult, man. And um, I, I felt like we pulled it off. I felt like the audience loved it, like they really enjoyed it. Um, for me... And I guess this is a, like a posthumous thing. I didn't realize the impact that Chris had on me as a writer and as a, as a, as a singer until I really started thinking about the fact that he had no boundaries when it came to writing music and doing whatever he wanted. If he wanted to try a genre, he'd do it. I mean, he was completely fearless. And for me, watching that over the years, I was so inspired by that, whether it was the heaviness of stuff like Jesus Christ pose or the beautiful acoustic stuff like seasons that he did on the the single soundtrack I've been a fan of his songwriting for so long that I almost took it for granted you know and my only regret is that I never got to tell him you know like I would met him several times and I never got to tell him what his music meant to me and I guess that's you know I mean and that's I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do outshined last night as much as I did because it, it just meant that much to me. What was he like as a person? He was super cool, man. He was like, he was very quiet. He's, uh, I don't want to say subdued, but he was almost shy, you know? Like he came out of his shell on stage and you could see it. And it was like, he was already a tall man, but he would stand up even taller and it was beautiful, man. Like, and his voice could fill arenas with nobody in it, just, just belt it out, you know? So to watch that transformation and see the juxtaposition, man, was really, really cool. And just, he was a sweetheart. Hydro grad. Yes. The upcoming album out June 30th. Yes. So, so far we've heard song number three and Fabulous. Yes. What can you tell us about what inspired those songs and kind of what they're about? Well, Fabulous is actually, <laughs> it's kind of my love letter to uh, the social media celebrities that we have. Um, very little content about his about as heavy as a Tupperware bowl, let's put it that way. And, uh, and that's where the line comes from. It's all downhill from here, you know? Like, it's just like, the, there are these people who are famous for nothing. Like, and I even thought, I, I thought it wouldn't get any worse than reality television people. And then the social media celebrities Instagram came. Instagram came about. Or Vine, I was like, what the hell? There were, there were whole Vine tours at one point. And the, like, I mean, thousands of screaming little girls. I'm like going, what the hell is this? Like, it was insane. So now 
now you have like the, the cash me outside chick and all that garbage. And I'm like, what did she do? Like at all? And well, and of course I'm just such an angry asshole anyway that I'll just say whatever comes into my head. So that's what that one's about. Song number three is actually about a certain kind of love that I don't think songwriters really talk about. It's like, it's that strong, passionate love, but it's also that undying love, you know? Like that, just the, the really, really good shit, you know? Everybody talks about the sappy stuff, and everybody talks about the, you know, the sexy stuff, but there's that middle section where one meets the other, and it's, you just never know which way it's gonna tip on any given moment, that mm, it's really, really good. That's what that song's about. Why is song number three track number five? Because um, it just made sense. The song's called song number three for a reason. I'm just not going to tell you what it is. Why not? Because it's my it's secret. It's mean, <laughs> evil. I'm a mean person. One of the other observations I made last night, and I've seen you live before, but yeah. you really feed off applause. Like this thing. Well, yeah. yeah. This thing kept coming. What is, and also you're like a caged animal on stage, but we're going to, we're going to deal with this thing first. Right. What's going through your mind when you're just like feeding off that applause and feeling all of that love from the audience? It's the, God, there's no way to describe it. And I know that's so cliche, but it really isn't. I mean, it's not, it's, it's adrenaline, it's sex, it's rage, it's passion, it's happiness, it's all of these incredible all-encompassing feelings all wrapped up into one but completely it feels completely different than any of them you know like it's flashing shades of different emotion at all times and just when you think it's going to ease down you go like that <laughs> oh, it comes right back it's just it's the best feeling on the planet. It really is. Especially when all you're doing is living to make sure that they have the best time of their lives, you know? And when they're showing that to you, it's just, it's perfect. Do people usually mosh to Through Glass? Because I, I was wasn't like, expecting what them the to. What the hell is going on? Or song number three for that matter. I was like, oh, really? Yeah. I've, I've seen people mosh to bother before. It's very off-putting. Is very, listen, if you're out there, you need fucking help, okay? You don't mosh to bother. You hold your phone up. You used to hold your lighter up. Now we hold our phones up or we stare into it while we watch it on TV, while you're watching real life on your screen. Knock that shit off too. Stop it. I was annoyed. I was annoyed because the guy next to me was live streaming that entire <laughs> performance. And A, it was kind of blocking my view, which okay, completely upset that. me. <laughs> but then it was also like, dude, stop. Yeah. It's, you know, this is tricky for me because this I am the dude who knocked a phone out of somebody's hand last year. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> and then caught hell for it. Um, my thing has always been... It's fine, do, do, you know, do, bring your phone, take pictures, do whatever you want. But why, you know, like you're there. Take pictures is fine, but why are you filming it? You're, you know, it's one thing to film it, it's another thing to just be staring at your screen while you're filming it. It's like, it's right there. Are you so terrified of real life that you can't do anything unless it's on that little four by four screen? It's. I was annoyed. Uh, yeah. It's very uh. weird. So you got me going now, damn it. It's been about a year since you've had your surgery, and yeah. you said it would take about a year for you to recover, and maybe you would never be back to 100%. Yeah. Where are you within that? Like, I'm how doing okay. I mean, yeah. last night was the first real time that I tried any kind of headbanging during a song or during a show. Um, it was interesting, man. Like, it was right because... The last time I saw you was actually right before I had my surgery because I didn't know I had a problem until then. So it's been a very weird roller coaster year for me. But last night I felt okay. I mean, I felt 43, but you know, I, I did okay. You know, I, I didn't look like a pile of shit on stage. So I was, I felt great. I, I still don't smoke, so my voice felt great. I felt like 
I, it was like probably one of the best shows I ever had as a singer, you know? I mean, and that's, and hopefully it just gets better, you know? It was great. Wow, you've stuck to the no smoking Yeah, thing. yeah, it's over a year, absolutely. Ooh, congratulations yeah. on that. Oh, don't get me wrong. I want one every day. <laughs> if they ever come up with one that's got vitamin C in it, we're done. So we know you're going to be focusing on Stone Sour for the immediate future. Yeah. When will that focus shift back to Slipknot? Fans, I'm sure, are curious. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe in a year and a half, something like that. Um, I mean, there's nothing that says we probably won't start getting, uh, like, demos and stuff together. But, I mean, for now, like, this is my, you know, this is my thing. And I think the guys are all kind of doing their own thing right now. So that's fine. I mean, we've always encouraged each other to kind of do our own thing. Um, when the time comes, the time comes. Maybe in a year or so, we'll start putting like new music together, and we'll just kind of see what happens. Hey, everyone. My name's Graham. This is Corey Taylor. And this is the new book, America 51. Okay. As if you didn't think he could get any angrier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no joke. But for real, oh well, it's it's quite the time to be angry. It's well, easy, yeah, right. So uh, they say we're living in Trump's America. Is America Fifty One Corey Taylor's America? A little bit, yeah, because I, I, the, the whole Trump's America thing is such a crock. Um, to, it's it's them. It's people trying to drum up more sensationalism, trying to drum up more difference more anger where you know this book is actually more about me trying to get everybody to see that we're more on the same page than we realize you know you're gonna have fringe on both yeah. sides but to me i would say 98 percent of americans are in the middle like i am where you're you know culturally liberal fiscally conservative you want what's best for you and yours and everybody else, you know? It's when the rhetoric comes screaming in from both sides that people get wound up. They start voting down party lines instead of thinking for themselves and thinking about what's best for them and what's best for their community and what's best for their state and what's best for the country. And it just turns into a goddamn shit show. So that's what this book is. It's, it's, it's me violently trying to remind people that we're more alike than we realize. Well, sure, and uh, I think it might be difficult for Trump supporters to get through the entire book because oh, yeah. there's definitely a lot of jabs taken at him. No, there's a lot of jabs taken at him, but there's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of jabs taken at liberals. At, at Hillary also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd, I take jabs at Hillary, at Obama, at, at Reagan, at everybody, you know, I mean, Democrats and Republicans alike, you know, I try, I try to skip because it's it, to me, it's not about one party being right or wrong. It's about what's right for the country. And right now, you know, they purport to think that they know what's best and yet they can't even get on the same page in their own, you know, their own, <laughs> their own goddamn party. It's like, really? All right, dude, whatever, you know? But do you worry that Trump supporters may not be able to see through what you're saying because of just of your use of the word Cheeto alone? Oh, the, <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, the thing that I've noticed about Trump supporters is that they are inflexible to the point of severity. If I worried about everything that I said around them, I wouldn't say it. So I can't start worrying about what this book says. People are going to be offended by it. Liberals are going to be offended by it. Sure. I, you know, everybody's going to be coming after me. However, I've already had a lot of people tell me, uh, give me overwhelming support for it because they agree with a lot of what's being said. So am I worried about a couple of, of fringe people? No. Am I bolstered by the fact that more people are actually in line with my way of thinking? Absolutely. It makes me relax a little more for the rest of the country. And Trump's win changed this book drastically. Quite. Uh, from what it was originally going to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How much did you actually delete? Because so, you addressed this in your book. Yeah, man. I had uh, I'd written f almost four chapters complete. And... Uh, you know, I was talking about the, the about Trump's candidacy in the past tense, and like, it it showed me just it was it was a good 
bit of mea culpa on my part. Sure. Let's put it that way. And I tell you what, sometimes even writers will get their head up their ass and really become almost self-obsessed with what they feel is going to be a sort of strange prediction. And I was certainly in that boat, you know. I mean, I obviously wasn't thrilled about a Clinton presidency, but at the same sure. time, looking at the two, the, to me, the choice was obvious. And yet it wasn't, you know. Even, 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 even when you break it down on the way he won, which was on the thinnest of... I think 60,000 yeah, votes, basically. That, and, yeah, if yeah. that. Uh, and spread across three states... And the fact that that was enough to turn the Electoral College against Hillary, who smoked him by three million votes. So it was it was contentious. And yet it is our political system. So whatever. All right. Let's take a look at why this happened. And a lot of it's on her. You know, oh, this sure. isn't was, this wasn't just because Trump was supported. This is because Hillary didn't do it right. And she certainly didn't try to do it right. And, you know, anybody who wants to argue those points with me, you're more than welcome to because it's very true. So I think they're both fucked. You do say in the book that, in a sense, you are glad that Trump won because it, it made the book better. You realize that. I say that, that yeah, but only from the standpoint of the bo of, of yes, my book. Just... Let's put it, that, let's be clear about that. <laughs> um, because honestly, it was ex the exact shock that I needed. You know what I'm saying? It got me off my high horse and got me, got my feet back on the ground. Let's put it that way, which I desperately needed. And uh, it made me start, it made me stop thinking that I knew what was going on in America and it made me take a look at actually what was, was going on in America and that to me made it a better book and, that, and honestly because of that standpoint I'm glad I just highlighted all you know four chapters and just I just erased it that day I started from scratch yeah yeah Speaking of that, this actually reminded me a bit of you're making me hate you at the end because you oh. turn it around as a 180. Like, in you're making me hate you, you turned it around after shredding everybody else. You're like, here, this is what's shitty about myself. Yeah, yeah. And this, after a lot of shredding on the Republicans, you go, here are the conservative positions that I agree with. Yeah. And I thought, to me, that was the most interesting part of the book. And I'm glad it was there because it, it made it more well-rounded, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, and it's true. It's absolutely true. I mean, growing up in Iowa, um, obviously I was instilled with, with a handful of, of pretty, I don't want to say fundamental, but, you know, pretty, you know, good common sense morals here and there, you know. I mean, obviously my work ethic is, is middle class and, and, uh, and conservative in a lot of ways. But I also believe in a healthy Second Amendment. I also believe in, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I hold a lot of things true on the conservative agenda. It's when all the rhetoric and dogma surrounding it gets pushed harder than what original conservatives wanted that I tend to start turning on that party, you know? It's like I said, you know, I, I've always been fiscally conservative, but I've also been, you know, culturally liberal. I support people's choice to live. If you're not hurting kids, each other, animals, anything, that, why should I care about how you live your life? You know right. what I'm saying? One thing that you mentioned in the book is that uh, going back to where the Democrats messed up in the election, that they wanted to appeal too much to the liberal intelligentsia. So... I was wondering, when writing this book, did you make a point to write it in a way that wasn't just going to appeal to that intelligentsia faction, you know, to really make it something that everybody, regardless of background? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I mean, I my approach to this book was very much the same way that I've approached all my other books. You know, it's, it's I didn't want to cater. Sure. I've never, I've never wanted to cater. And... If I, if I tried too hard to write a certain way because I feel like maybe it's a reflection of what I'm purported to be or, right. you know, whether it's a dirty word in some people's mouths, you know, the, the so-called coastal elitism, whatever the fuck 
that means. <laughs> um, I think that would have been an, a great way to put a bullet in this book as well, you mm -hmm. know? So for me, it was more important to make sure that my it was my voice saying exactly what I thought. And it, the risk is there. If people don't agree with it, that's fine. People don't agree with a lot of the stuff and, and you're making me hate you as well. This book, obviously, much more of a, uh, a firebrand. Um, it's very incendiary. It can start a conflagration like that. And yet, if I don't come from the heart with this stuff, and come from my my set of beliefs, then why write the book in the first place? You know. Yeah. Well, and I know in the past uh, you have had the approach to basically word vomit. Yeah. When right. you're writing, and I could tell by this one, I'm like, oh yeah, he's in that constant stream oh, of yeah. like, projectile yeah. <laughs> word vomiting. But it comes out very good, and uh, also in in the way that you're an Anglophile as well, you know, oh, yeah. You, yeah. you know, putting these sentences together and and, and the way you do it. So it's like carefully vomiting and and like spreading the pieces as you as you. Yeah, work. almost satirical in a way. You know, yeah, there's yeah. there are definitely parts where. It was a little more tongue in cheek than than too risque, you know. Like it was, oh, yeah, it was yeah. kind of playing with it. I I felt like I was kind of expanding where I've come from in the past, you know. Like like for all intents and purposes, as angry as you're making me hate you is, it's a very silly book, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah. It's very silly, and I'm very proud of that. The fact that I could kind of churn up that kind of angst and yet still have it be something where it's a bit ridiculous, you know. With this book. I, I didn't want it to go in that direction. I wanted it to be much more in that satirical, where it's 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 thought provoking. It, it makes you laugh a little more, but there's also a, a deep, deep seated seriousness that I, I hope translates. And sometimes you, you're so close to it, you just don't know. But luckily, like I mean, even my editor was like, "Holy God, this is probably your angriest," but. Yep. It wasn't overdone. Like it, yeah. it wasn't angry for angry's sake. It was actually trying to make a, a very poignant message come through, you know. So I I mean that's honestly that's all I really was trying to do. Another part of the book that really caught my eye is first of all you left it open that you are going to write another book and that at some point you will release a comprehensive memoir. Uh, yeah. Quote: Just wait till the ones who can testify are dead. <laughs> so, well, yeah. How long are we gonna have to wait for this thing? Who do we I have to know. kill? People, people live a long time. These I want to. I want to read this book <laughs> sooner than later. So, uh, we'll have to see. I'd uh, probably be. I man. I don't know. I mean, I've still got a lot of living to do, man. So I'm still kind of running around trying to. Yeah, I don't. I just. I feel like I haven't peaked yet, which I don't know if I just jinxed myself, but it's. Uh, it's weird, you know? It's one of those things where you never want to feel like you had to stop just so you could write your story. You know, you want to oh, kind of sure. keep going. Yeah. So if I ever did do it, I don't know if you, I don't even know if I would do it myself. I'd probably have somebody just follow me around and write it for me, you Okay. Know? Just so it could just so it wouldn't feel biased? like an auto. Yeah, exactly biased. Yeah. I mean, cuz sometimes the best way to tell the story is to to not be a part of it. And another theme that you uh, touch on throughout the book is the theme of empathy and the need yes. for empathy. Yeah, uh, and that might surprise some people uh, from the guy who wrote People Equal. Well, there's that. But there's the other side to to CMFT as yeah, well absolutely. about empathy. And uh, do you feel like people are lacking uh, the the right amount of empathy? At oh, this absolutely. Point? Yeah. Um, and I'd love to know where it went. I'd love to know where that you know, the, the, where that needle came from in the heart of everything. Uh, maybe that'll be what my next book's about I'm trying right. to figure that out. Um, when you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes, how are we supposed to relate to each other? Let alone talk to each other or get, a, get each other to see our, like each other's side of things. That is the very basis of our government, as the very basis of the way we run our government is by compromise, not by absolutes, not by anything that resembles absolutes. That's how you set up a despot. 
You have to compromise. That's why when the two-party system does work, it works in a bipartisan manner. Sure. It's one of the reasons why we're seeing what's going on right now. You have Republican majority in the House and Congress, and not to mention the fact that you have a Republican president and a fairly tipped, stacked deck with the Supreme Court. Yeah, and yet, it's five, four now. And yeah. yet nothing is getting done. He can't even fill his cabinet, goddammit. He can't fill his, like, right. all of the government positions that need to be filled. It's it's uncanny. I've never seen this happen. I've lived through some shit in this, you know? Like, I, I grew up in the Reagan years where sure, it was sure. a little crazy then. But that this makes this look like a and sitcom on Netflix, for Christ's sakes. Reagan was one of those people who very loved, very amicable, very em- could empathize. Oh, sure. He had an agenda, but that agenda changed as he saw that the the will of the people, the good for the good of the people, had to mean different things to di- in different places. You know, it wasn't a microcosm. It's the whole reason that Reaganomics didn't work in the first place. Even on a macro level, and we're seeing this in Kansas, it doesn't work. People say, well, it works in local communities. Not really. Um, and it's certainly not going to work if everything's deregulated to the point where a, a person can't make a living wage. But you have to have empathy. You know, A lot of the people who are in, who hold an office now, they, they don't empathize with the people they represent. They, they, couldn't, even, they couldn't even switch places with them for a day. You think Mike Pence could go and dig ditches for a day? <laughs> Not even <laughs> close. <laughs> You've done a lot of really good things for the mental health community, uh, just as a spokesperson. Uh, and one thing that's really been bothering me online is to see people calling Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington cowards. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... And I wanted to get your opinion on that because I like what you did with the UROC Foundation. I like what you did uh, talking with a therapist yeah. on Viceland. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to hear your voice on this. Uh, calling them cowards is a very immature way of looking at it. Um, obviously, they're hurt, which is why they're lashing out and saying that. Um, it's, the, it's the easy way to look at something like that because it, it, it makes you not have to face what a serious issue it is. It's, it's easy for someone to label it like that so they can turn their back on it and pretend that it was something that didn't happen to them, you know, when inside they're hurting, you know, people who fight depression are almost in a constant state of hurting you know sure like it it comes and goes you know the tide rises the tide ebbs and sometimes it's it's hard to it's hard to get you know past that break so i i think people need to realize that not only are not only is that immature but it's also a cop-out and it's it's needlessly needlessly simplifying a very real issue and uh, an issue that might have a lot to do with a lot of the other issues that are going on in our country right now whether it's suicide or the opioid problem that's going on right now people don't want to feel why do they not want to feel let's get to the bottom of that let's get to the bottom of why there is a rise in not only PTSD but severe depression across the board. I mean, I suffer from manic depression, which means I rise and fall, I crash and I burn. I've got the practice and I've got the the people to talk to so I can keep myself from really breaking myself against the, that wall. But it's it's tough, man, it's tough. And some people don't have that luxury. Some people, like our friends, the wall pushes back. And it is a goddamn tragedy that does not make them cowards. And I've even heard people recently say something to the fact of it was bound to happen. It was, this was always going to happen. And I've gotten so angry hearing that, 
that I have gone on record as saying that that you are absolutely wrong for saying that. No one that, that, that suicide should not be a foregone conclusion. That means you're not listening. You say you care about that person. That means you're not listening. So I'm listening. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure that people know that there are people out there listening. That there are places to go, whether it's a friend or a stranger. There are organizations, there are centers, there are people who are dedicated to listening. Because sometimes that's all you need, is just someone to listen. You just need to tap that valve. It, it, it's not going to change the severity of it, but it's going to help you feel a little better. It will take away that solitary confinement. It will take away that sense that you're alone. You're not. You're not alone. Not one person out there who feels that way is alone. I feel it. I'm sure you know people who feel it or you feel it. You're not alone. And it is important for people to know that. You're not a coward. You're, just, you're not alone. Get the help you need. There are ways to find it. And I'm sure we could put some information on a bunch of different uh, organizations who can help. CMFT. Yeah. I have a 2019 calendar in front of me. What I'm going to ask is, since Tool is, uh, <laughs> since Tool is headlining the festival, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. getting all the bands to predict uh -huh. the new album release date. Oh, you can pick any Friday that's not already chosen by another band. Okay. Since that's release day, so any day that you would like to choose. Hey, so you're talking 2000. So this is next year. 2019. You guys all think that Tool's going to put out an album next year, January 17th. 2020. 20, okay. An arbitrary choice yes. by yeah. Corey Taylor, but if you wouldn't mind showing the people. Uh, <laughs> what, that I'm an asshole? Yeah, thing. there you go. Many on Reddit and elsewhere have noted we follow Corey Taylor pretty closely around here. You may recall. <laughs> You may recall Loudwire even changed their name to Notwire on the day Slipknot release. We are not your kind. Corey now has a solo album on the way, and he's joining us to talk about it this evening. But before we get into it, I got to know, what are your thoughts on that name change? That was so funny, and I, I didn't know anything about it until somebody hit me up, and they were like, you need to go and look at Loudwire's page. And I was just losing it i was like that is such a, such a great way to troll the trolls yeah it just made me so happy and i was just like yeah you know what people just take themselves way too seriously sometimes they need to shove it up their ass all right i'm glad you got i'm glad you got a kick out of it oh right. i loved it i thought it was great agreed i was going through your socials hmm. just to see like what the latest is and you are and you have been way less active than you used to be social media addiction is a very real thing do you think you were at that level and how do you feel now that you've eliminated that for the most part from your life oh i was definitely addicted to it absolutely i mean and it's and i didn't realize it until i was trying to extricate myself from it that i realized what a hold it had on me man i mean it was it was pretty brutal, you know? I mean, and for somebody who prides himself and, and, you know, keeping himself clean and keeping himself aware, when I had that realization, it really bummed me out that I'd really kind of gone down this, this wormhole. Now, the circumstances, why, kind of lent itself to why I was so, you know, kind of infatuated and stuck in that world. However, once I really kind of had that realization, it was time for me to step away. So I don't even run my socials anymore. I have a, mm. I have a, I have someone who runs my Twitter and my Instagram and I, you know, once in a while I'll give them something to post, but they just basically do the stuff for me and I stay away. And honest, I got to be honest, it's, it was probably the best thing I could have ever done because it was getting really bad. Wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't realize you weren't even running them at this point. Very cool. So yeah, yeah. So cruise ships and COVID-19 don't have a good history, right? The first ever Not Fest at Sea Festival <laughs> was originally scheduled for August 2020, pushed back to August 2021, recently announced that it's been postponed for the foreseeable future. Why'd you go from pushing it up a year to where we are now? And do you still see a profitable future somewhere down the line for these festival-type cruises? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, right now is a blip. You know, I mean, if you look at history... Something like this hasn't happened for a hundred years, you know, and I don't see it really happening again but for another hundred. The larger problem is because nobody was at the goddamn wheel, 
You know, nobody took this seriously. And then because of our disregard for the sheer seriousness of this, the gravity of it, we were left with the country just in flames, uh, the economy running muck. It just, you know, whereas had we handled this correctly, we'd probably be coming out of the woods right now, or at least preparing for the second wave. So I, I do not think this is a portent, you know, a, a portent of, of things to come. I feel like this is something that is a temporary reprieve from our normal way of life. We are going to adapt. We are going to assemble. We are going to move on. We are going to, all of us, hopefully take the vaccine that will help us all get through this. And then we'll be back to business as usual. That's what I think. But we have to slow our goddamn heels down and wait and do it right instead of trying to rush it because we all think we're smarter than scientists. Speaking of handling it correctly, have you seen the uh, if Slipknot can wear mass memes? And how do you feel about being brought into the conversation that is encouraging people to wear masks? I mean, it was just a matter of time. You know, (laughs) as soon as the mask thing started, I was just like, oh, here we go. (laughs) You know, it just seems like every every time something like that kind of hits the zeitgeist, our name gets brought up, which I'm pretty proud of. You know, like I I keep looking at all these Karens and these people who just are are having freak outs and Walmarts and targets Mm -hmm. about wearing a mask. I just look at these people and I go, you please. Get out of my face with that. I wear it for a living. You can't wear it for 10 seconds to go buy some produce. (laughs) Exactly. On a a more serious note, what do you think of Kanye West running for president, but really more importantly, the world critiquing his mental health? It is so disturbing to see him trending for the last few nights and people just being cruel and insensitive. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I mean, obviously, people know that I've had my issues with Kanye for a long time, but I'm watching this now very closely. I mean, at first, I, I remember when he first announced this uh, in that weird rant that he did on MTV when he was given a uh, Thanks for Showing Up award. When he had first announced it then, I laughed. But then seeing this this behavior that is happening right now, that worries me. You know, that's not the normal behavior of someone who is, that seems like someone who's having a mental break, to be honest. That sounds like someone who is like borderline. That, that's, I don't want to say it's borderline personality disorder, but it almost feels bipolar. Mm-hmm. When you have a bigger sign like that and you exacerbate it with fame and money and all of these different things, people have a right to be concerned. You know, I mean, he's got a family. He's got people who, you know, care about him and worry about him. It's, it's, it's one thing to laugh about it from afar. It's another thing to watch a breakdown happening in real time, especially with someone who is loved by so many people and is actually, you know, a lot of his actions are taken very seriously. So when he says some of that shit, people take him seriously. It's like Trump. People take what he says very seriously. And that's a danger. So we have to be very, very careful and and watch what's being said. I just hope that he gets the help that he needs. Let's put it that way. All right, let's get into it. We know that you finished recording your solo debut album, so exciting, tentatively due in September from what I'm reading. Tell me something about the upcoming record that you have not shared in previous interviews, whether that's about the process or the songs. Like, What gets you really excited to talk about? I guess the thing that I'm most excited for people to hear is the energy and the excitement in the in the music you know this is probably the most alive album i've done in a long time it's probably the 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 most fun i've had making an album since the first slipknot album to be honest it was just it was so much fun getting to do this album with songs that i've been sitting on some of these songs going back you know 20 plus years Hmm. and doing it with some of my best friends in the world I mean, there's there's nothing that even comes close to that feeling. Going to work was an absolute joy. Playing the songs was an absolute joy. Watching them come together and hearing them back. We were all so stoked that that's what I want people to feel when they hear it for the first time. It's going to throw people for a loop because it is unlike anything I've ever done. However, it is the most fun album people are going to hear 
in all of 2020. It is that much, it's that much fun to listen to it's that much fun to sing along to. And it's probably the biggest middle finger to all the haters in, in the world. I love it. And, uh, and I think people are really going to enjoy it. We could definitely all use a little fun. We already know that you learned piano so you can create a song for your yeah. wife, which is so romantic. I'm sure she's loving that. Were there any other firsts for you on the record? Um, I mean, I mean, playing piano and singing home was, was, was pretty big. That was a pretty big first. This is the first time my name is in a, uh, a producing credit for like officially, like I've done a lot of like co-producing in the past with the various projects that I've been attached to, but this is the first one where it was me and Jay Rustin, like doing all of the production together. And he is just such a great partner to work with. We both were just on the same page. I played guitar on every song in the album, with the exception of everybody dies on my birthday. And yeah, I mean, I just really, I knew exactly what I wanted to hear. I knew exactly what I wanted to feel. And then anything else after that was just extra. And, and it, it felt really good to collaborate with these guys. So a lot of firsts on this, but I, I think, I, I think it's really the first time I've been able to wear so many of my influences on my sleeve and be able to show the world a, a deeper pocket where my, uh, my love for music comes from. You've shared that there are 13 original songs on the record. You also recorded several covers and acoustic versions of the originals. Where is all this extra material yeah. going? Uh, well, that's going to come out later. Uh, all this some, some, uh, some exclusive content with some releases that will happen. Um, uh, just, you know, just, just, at, just extra stuff. It's mm-hmm. always good to have extra stuff. It always sucks when you look around and you're like, God, you wish you could have acoustic version of this or a really cool cover of this we wanted to go above and beyond or at least i did and make sure that we had enough stuff to make sure that this release was really important so at some point all of this stuff will get released i know we're talking about doing something on record store day uh that could be really really cool but at some point all of this stuff will be released and we're talking about covers from everything from the dead boys to eddie money uh to john John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band. I mean, it's we went deep with it, and it's really, really, really good. I, I can't wait for people to hear it. The song that you wrote in high school, what could you possibly still connect with from your high school years? Like, th- what is that song about? Well, that song was is really just kind of just some prose that I had written down, like basically a poem. You know, it was kind of like an edgy poem that I wrote down. It was actually something that really kind of had a country connotation to it. When I wrote it down, it was just basically about, you know, if I had to really sum it up, it would be, you know, just being young and wanting to run and get as far away from the place that you're in as, as you possibly can. You know, it's about meeting up with the devil and the devil basically giving you a choice and you deciding that, you're going to make the devil chase you to force you to make that choice. And that kind of fueled the, the music for it, that fueled the, the fire to, to kind of throw it together. And everybody who's heard it has compared it to a rockabilly version of Charlie Daniels. There's, you know, a, a really cool riff that feels like Pantera in it. That It's just, it's a really cool hybrid song that I really can't wait for people to hear. There's a little Thin Lizzy in there. It's, 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 it's badass. You wrote the foreword to Nothing But a Good Time. It's an upcoming book about the hard rock music of the 80s. You're also appearing in an 80s sci-fi doc in Search for Tomorrow. What was Corey Taylor like in the 80s? Like, what were you listening to, favorite movies? And how did that era influence the musician and artist you are today? In the 80s, I was just a, a poor kid with chapped lips and a, and a really <laughs> bad haircut. Let's put it that way. I was, I was just, uh, you know, I mean... The 80s were when I went from elementary school to high school and basically kind of ran the gamut of everything that you could possibly go through. Being homeless as a kid, then being ostensibly being homeless as a teenager, but then you know being strung out on drugs. I mean, it, the 80s were a tough time for Corey Taylor, yeah, <laughs> put it this way. Like it. The only good thing about the 80s to me was the entertainment. You know, some the great music came out of the 80s, um, really the, the seeds for who I was going to become started in the 80s, um, whether it was the movies that I was watching or the music I was listening to or the comics I was reading or, 
you know, the, the different, different groups I was hanging with, whether it was the goth kids or the punk kids or the metal kids or the skate kids, like I just kind of was, it really kind of formed the basis of who I am as a person because, you know, I've, I'm very amiable and I get along with a lot of people, but I've always also just kind of walked my own path, man. You know, I've never followed anyone. I've never tried to join anything. Um, and which is ironic. I mean, all the bands that I've, I've ever been in, I was either asked to join or I started myself, you know? So it was, it's one of those things where, you know, I've always been very comfortable doing my own thing. And if it includes other people, so be it. But if not, I'm kind of cool just being by myself, you know? And uh, I think a lot of that started when I was a kid uh, growing up in the eighties and just really having nothing and having to get on, you know, figure out ways to entertain myself by having nothing. Yeah. All right. We'll wrap on that note. A million thanks to Corey mother F and Taylor. We will keep you posted <laughs> on all of his happenings as per usual. I know and continued health and success to you and yours, Corey. Thanks again. Thanks again.